I'm Tim Blackburn and I'm the director of the Institute of Zoology, the scientific department of ZSL. Our primary mission is to carry out science for the benefit of conservation. Our scientists focus on questions that help us to understand how the natural world works, how wildlife populations are changing as their environment changes, and how we can best manage the environment to maintain biodiversity. This is vital work because the integrity of the natural world is being threatened in a way it has never experienced before. It's being threatened because one animal has become so dominant and so abundant in the environment that it's forcing out most other species. That animal, of course, is Homo sapiens, humans. Humans are destroying natural habitats and using the land for agriculture, industry and housing. We're hunting and fishing natural populations towards extinction. We're polluting the atmosphere so that areas are becoming uninhabitable by the species that normally live there. And we're moving other species to areas where they don't normally live, with potentially disastrous consequences for the native species they encounter. Our research is responding to this crisis in a number of important ways. First of all, we're working to quantify how wildlife populations are changing over time in the face of these increasing pressures from humanity. One of the projects that we're working on is trying to monitor uh, many different populations of animals around the world. Uh, and we create an index, uh, much like a stock market index, we're tracking the population numbers of lots of different species of wildlife around the globe. The public might assume that we know more than we do about the whereabouts of animals in the wild. But actually it's a really difficult thing to do. I mean, animals spend their time hiding from people. Oftentimes they're threatened by people. So camera traps are like security cameras, but they're independent units that can go uh, on, a, on a tree next to a game trail. Camera trap studies are, are really important um, because they provide us with basic information about the distribution and the abundance of species. One of the things we're trying to understand in Antarctica is how penguin populations are reacting to a changing climate. We're trialling a new uh, technique to put time-lapse cameras out overlooking colonies. Uh, so we establish uh, a camera um, on a tripod and we then leave that taking photos overlooking a colony um, over an entire year so that when we get the information back we can have a look at uh, a number of different things. So when penguins are returning to their colonies to breed, uh, how many uh, of them are breeding successfully and what are the impacts of the changing environment around them. You have a wide range of things that you can observe with satellite. Information about ecosystem structure, ecosystem functioning, such as, for example, uh, spatial and temporal variation in primary productivity. That is, uh, vegetation production from one time period to another. So integrating satellite monitoring within current biodiversity monitoring scheme is really vital to understand how the pulse of the Earth is changing from one decade to another, to, from one year to another. The UK Cetacean Strandings Investigation Programme, its main aims at the moment are to record information on all stranded cetaceans and also seals, marine turtles and basking sharks. We try and record some basic information. We try and get a photograph wherever we can so we can just pin it down to species. We try and get the sex of the animal, the length of the animal, uh, where it was found and when it was found and that all goes into the UK National Database. Monitoring wildlife is the first step, but where declines are happening, we need to understand why. Much of the work we do investigates why changes in animal populations happen. And then if it's in good enough condition, we'll either retrieve it to bring it back to land for post-mortem or come out to a location like this to try and do a post-mortem on site. And the reason we're doing that is to try and learn you know, how, how the animal died and then what element of that mortality is anthropogenic, is, is caused by man. A major conservation threat in West Africa and Central Africa is the trade in the meat of wild animals, otherwise known as the bushmeat trade. The bushmeat trade is a traditional practice, but in recent years it has become increasingly unsustainable. Human populations have been growing. The habitat that's available to the wild animals has been declining. We have been carrying out research to try to better understand the impacts of the trade, both on the wild animal populations, 
but also on the livelihoods of those people who were involved in it. Finch trichomonosis is an emerging infectious disease which we first diagnosed in 2005. We've shown that there has been a very highly significant decline of green finch populations across Great Britain. Emerging infectious diseases are known to threaten critically endangered species. However, the extent to which they can cause dramatic declines in common wildlife populations in well-studied areas in a short time frame is very poorly appreciated. Well, we've been working on amphibian disease for about oh, 20, 25 years now. During that period, we helped to discover um, chytridiomycosis, which is a completely new disease of uh, amphibians. And we found that it was killing amphibians and leading to population extinctions and species extinctions. Since then, and we found that it's causing amphibian declines at a global level uh, and it's actually the, probably the most important infectious disease in the history of the world from a biodiversity point of view. Once we know what's driving the decline of a population, the obvious next step is to work out how we can stop or reverse that decline and actually go out and turn the resulting knowledge into practical action. Up till now, the only real way of protecting a species that's affected by this disease is to bring animals into captivity. They can be treated in captivity if they're infected because the, the fungal agent that causes chytridiomycosis is actually quite easy to kill with certain regular antifungal drugs. Um, but of course we can't do that in the wild. We can't go around treating animals in the wild um, en masse because of the logistical difficulties and also the biological issues of releasing fungicides in large quantities into the environment. So we're looking at other ways that we might be able to mitigate this disease. The Myrican midwife toad is actually a living fossil. It was a species that was only known from the fossil record until a few decades ago when it was rediscovered living in the mountains of Majorca. Unfortunately, we've detected infection in several populations of the Myrican midwife toad. You can't treat infectious disease in wild populations like you treat infectious disease in a hospital. You can't come out and expect to clear infection from every single animal in the wild. Instead, what we're doing is we're piloting approaches to see how much effort needs to be put in to knock down infection to levels where it's less likely to cause the death of Myrican midwife toads. So what we're trying to do is see if we can strike a balance between the disease and the toad so it can actually live with the infection and not experience declines due to it. A major part of our work and our research has been looking at forms of marine contaminants found in cetaceans and then the impact they might be having at a population level on, on certain species. And because the data we've collected, that's gone towards the banning of certain compounds at an EU-wide level. So there's a, definitely a very real uh, relationship between the information that we collect and policy decisions at a local, national and an international level. Cheetah are a very unusual carnivore in that they range really widely. We need areas ten times the size of that we need for lions for cheetah conservation. The protected area network is important but they need even bigger areas. Um, if they're going to be conserved in the long term. And that led us to establish the range-wide conservation planning initiative, developing regional strategies for cheetah conservation. So we're now working in 27 countries in Africa along that programme. The Institute of Zoology is a small organisation. To be really effective, we need to work with a wide range of partners around the world. Our work on amphibian disease and declines involves a huge range of uh, collaborators across the world. In the Caribbean, uh, we're involved with, with partner organisations such as Chester Zoo and Dura Wildlife Conservation Trust in investigating the impacts on the mountain chicken frog. And we're, we're just starting a, a, a project with collaborators in, in China uh, to look at whether or not chytridiomycosis is playing any role in the decline of Chinese giant salamanders. At London Zoo and the Institute of Zoology, 
uh, are collaborating together on amphibian infectious disease in, in various ways and various different projects. It's a two-way process, the collaborations really, that we can help the Institute of Zoology by maintaining animals in captivity and we gain a better understanding of their biology and also they can help advise us on our disease management in our living collections. So the Garden Bird Health Initiative is a very highly collaborative project which relies on input from vets, ornithologists and scientists and it's of interest and supported by animal welfare groups, the garden bird food industry and also DEFRA, the government. One thing we're doing at the moment is developing a training course for protected area managers so that they have the basics that they need to implement cheetah conservation on the ground. But we also are very much engaged with one-on-one -on -one mentoring because it's really that long-term relationship that you build up with people on the ground um, where they feel they can just ask you a question as and when they need it and get your advice and get your support that actually really I find develops sort of lasting capacity. One of the keys to effective conservation is to engage with the general public. It's the public who ultimately decide the fate of the environment through the choices they make in how they use land and resources. And the public can also act to help the research we do here at the Institute. The camera trap projects end up collecting lots and lots of images of animals. And it takes quite a lot of time for scientists to process all those images. And so if we can get public participation in that process, that could be a really important initiative. Instant Wild is a technology-based initiative where the images that are taken are uploaded through um, phone networks. The Photographs are then uploaded into a website which can be accessed by the public through the Instant Wild app. So it's really important to bring the public in to take part in uh, what is an important kind of monitoring activity. The Garden Bird Health Initiative has been an incredibly successful project with the public support. And what we'd like to do in the future is to roll out this model and investigate the health of British amphibian species and also hedgehogs using the same approach. Alarmingly, the hedgehog population has declined by approximately a quarter in the last 10 years. To date, there's been no investigations to determine whether infectious or non-infectious disease may be playing some role in this decline, and that's something that we would like to urgently investigate. Engaging the public is doubly vital, because we need people to know how important the work we're doing at the Institute is for them. Conservation matters for wildlife, but wildlife matters for people. Humans rely on biodiversity for, for many things in their life. It, the, the natural systems around us filter our water, they provide us with food, with fish, they provide us with clothing, timber and materials. In all the studies that we've done as scientists, um, they show us that large, intact, diverse systems do all of those jobs much better. And one of the most spectacular cases that I've been involved with is investigating the declines of vultures in South Asia, and particularly in India. During the 1990s, the population crashed rapidly, possibly the fastest decline of any bird species ever recorded in the world. And it turned out that the birds were being killed when they were feeding on the carcasses of cattle or buffalo that had been treated with a, a pain-killing drug that had been given to those animals shortly before they had died. Now, you might think, well, that's really sad for the vultures, um, but, but so what? but uh, there have been some incredible knock-on effects of these vulture declines. Some you might have been able to predict. So for example, you end up with lots of decomposing buffalo, cattle, um, goat, sheep carcasses around the place. And that's a real problem in itself. It's a health hazard for the local population. But with all this super abundance of food lying around, we get other scavengers coming in. And um, one of those species is the domestic dog. And so now in India, there's a huge population explosion in what were domestic dogs, but they attack children, they attack adults, um, but they also carry disease. We do this work because we believe that nature is vital to human well-being, but also 
because we think that the natural world is intrinsically beautiful and valuable. We should be nature's protectors, not its destroyers. We don't want the beauty and wonder of nature to be lost to our children. If you want to know more about the work we do, you can find us online at www.zsl.org forward slash science.